first time, um, this isn't the first time that I've actually um, listened in vain for the theme of what I want to share. Um, but I have something on my heart that I do want to share. First of all, I just want to say a big thank you for the opportunity. Um, tonight I'm going, oh, this, this morning, whichever one it is, I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm going to be anchored. Um, this morning, our time, I was speaking in a, um, an ordinary church and I had a tie mic and I could wander. And I'm much more a wanderer than a sitting in the same place preacher. I'm not sure that I actually qualify as a preacher, but tonight I want to talk about glory. And I want to start in John's gospel, just um, looking at part of chapter one, verse 14. And my key verse is going to be this, and we, beheld his glory. Um, I, I need to give you a little bit of background as to how this started for me because um, I have um, an immense privilege of being um, a mentor to a group of uh, pupils in the Christian Fellowship School. So every Friday we have half an hour we talk about all sorts of things um, and one of the things I discovered is that people, the, uh, the group that I have are actually not very good at reading their Bibles. Now, that's, I, I, it's shocking. I appreciate that. But they actually weren't um, up to date with that, anything in that. They did, had no pattern, no consistency. So I gave them a challenge. And I said, OK, guys, listen, why don't you use the U Bible on your phones? And you could read just one chapter of John's Gospel a day. <clears throat> And then in three weeks, you've read the whole of John's gospel. I'm giving you a challenge. Now, it's fine me giving them a challenge, but um, really you can't give a challenge to somebody else unless you're willing to do something the same yourself. So I decided that I was going to read John's gospel a chapter a day on top of what I would normally be reading. And I, um, I don't know quite why. I did it. I, I'm a New King James man. I'll, I'll put that out there. I'm very sorry if you are an authorised per version person, but I'm, I'm into New King James. But for this, I, I decided I was going to read a translation. And in, in, if you look in the U Bible, I think there's 27 different English translations of the, uh, the Bible there. And most of them I hadn't read. So I decided I would pick one that I hadn't ever used before. And I started, I read through, and you know what? I actually enjoyed it. So much so that when I got to the end of the uh, three weeks, I went back to the beginning and started again in a different version that I'd never used before. And I actually did five different versions of chapter a day through John's gospel, um, and it was it, it blew my mind. Um, and the reason it blew my mind is that for the first time, I, I, I might be explaining a little bit as we go on, I'm a bear of very little brain. Um, for all the, the kind words that Peter's spoken about me, I don't feel I qualify for them at all. Um, and I'd never realized until the end of those five weeks that, well, People in those days didn't use kind of holy speak to each other. They spoke in ordinary language. They talked so just like Pete Boyle might talk, you know, um, just ordinary stuff. And that kind of opened up something to me. I, I, I want to read um, for us this evening just a little bit. Um, I hope you'll pardon me, but I'm going to read it from the contemporary English version. 2012. Um, I, I'd prefer it if you didn't look it up in your Bibles because you'll think in that Bible speak. Um, and I want you just to hear um, what I'm going to read. It's from Luke's Gospel. Um, you'll all know where it is as soon as I start reading it, I hope. And it goes like this That night in the fields near Bethlehem, some shepherds were guarding their sheep. 
all at once an angel came down to them from the Lord, and the brightness of the Lord's glory flashed around them. The shepherds were frightened, but the angel said, don't be afraid. I've got good news for you, which will make everyone happy. This very day in King David's hometown, a saviour was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. You'll know who he is because you'll find him dressed in baby clothes and lying on a bed of hay. Suddenly, many other angels came down from heaven and joined in praising God. They said, praise God in heaven, peace on earth to everyone who pleases God. After the angels had left and gone back to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see what the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and they saw the baby lying on a bed of hay. When the shepherds saw Jesus, they told his parents what the angel had said about him. Everyone listened and was surprised. But Mary kept thinking about all this and wondering what it meant. As the shepherds returned to their sheep, they were praising God and saying wonderful things about him. Everything they had seen and heard was just as the angel had said. Okay, now, did you recognize that as scripture? It's almost, um, it's, I mean, it sounds like somebody just telling me a story from, you know, um, just somebody here. We get so used to the Bible language that sometimes we don't hear what's being said. And I was reading that, but I'm reading it from the New King James. Um, just that, uh, the verse 20 there, it says, then the shepherds return. Now we're back into familiar territory. Then the shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. OK, so I, I need to give you a bit of an outline. Um, I hope it'll be a quick one as to where I intend to go with some pointers so that you'll be able to, to keep in, in touch with me. And the, my goal is to look at the sort of glory it was that John and the disciples saw. You see, in that chapter one, John is outlining the most important thing that he saw about Jesus. And what he wanted us to know was that with his own eyes, he had beheld, he had seen, looked at, considered this Jesus and had seen glory. Um, so, okay, so this is my outline of what we'll be doing. We're going to, um, we've looked at, to start with, the reason I was looking at glory in the first place. <clears throat> Next, we'll have a quick glimpse of the sort of glory perhaps we might think of most from the Old Testament. You know, the the bright, shiny, awesome, heavenly sort. Um, again, that's going to be brief. Mm. Then we'll come to the main part where we look at the occasions in John's gospel. We're not going to look at them all where there's glory. Mm. There are quite a few in John. And then finally, I just want to consider what we've learned about the nature of the glory that John talked about. Now, OK, here we go. <clears throat> um, I don't know, uh, I, I can't see you all now. Um, I don't know whether you're like me, but I have an incredible ability to remember things from 50, 60 years ago. And generally, they're not the nice, happy things. They're the things where I opened my mouth, oh, I did something, and it was dumb. And I, I, there's somebody who keeps on reminding me of what a total numbskull I am. And in fact, I've written a, a little bit of a biography of why I am like I am, so that my grandchildren would have a, an idea why granddad's like he is. <clears throat> and I've given it a title and I called it, Where's That Wally? Because all the way through my life, I have felt like 
I'm that, you know, that guy that's walking around in the, in the striped shirt and the, the, the beret and everybody else is dressed different, doing other things. <clears throat> and I've never, ever felt that I fit in to this world. <clears throat> and one of the things that I, I have to live with is this idea that, oh, I, I said so-and-so, oh man, how could I have done that? Now, <clears throat> one of the things I remember from, must be 55 years ago, I was um, around 15 at the time, and it was the beginning of God moving uh, in, in England, and particularly in Liverpool, <clears throat> and the, the Holy Ghost was coming into um, prominence. We'd never heard of him before. I mean, I didn't know that there was a thing called the Holy Ghost, because every Sunday we, we finished with the, the, um, the grace, you know, and <clears throat> there was something in the grace you know, about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, I had no idea what that meant. In fact, I didn't even know that it had a meaning. Now, in that state of really awful um, ignorance, I remember volunteering to do a Bible study for our church youth group on the, the few verses in the Bible where the Holy Spirit was mentioned. I, I should add, as you probably are well aware, that I, I wasn't reading my Bible like I should be. So I was never able to do that study because the moment I started looking, I couldn't help it, but the Holy Spirit was everywhere and I'd never noticed. Well, I'm feeling a bit like that now after all these years, because even though I've been reading my Bible on a regular and systematic basis for a, a long while now, I've just discovered that there's glory everywhere. Isn't that wonderful that this Bible of ours, it's filled with glory. So um, I want to look, and there's so many aspects to glory that we could be looking at, but I want to look at glory as it is shown in John's gospel with that verse in mind, okay? So before we do that, I just want to have a refresh us. Not, um, although having looked around uh, on the list of people that are here tonight, I'm sure that you could probably refresh me a lot better than I can refresh you. But the most obvious place and time to be looking for glory um, of the bright and shiny sort would be in the days of Moses, wouldn't it? You know, um, Moses went upon the mountain and the tabernacle was dedicated, you know. And the strange thing is that in the New King James Version, he hastens to add, except for and um, Joseph's message to his dad, there's no mention of that word glory until we get into Exodus. And we find that God is coming down in glory. So in Exodus 16 and verse 10, um, we can read, um, I'm in the New King James now, so it will sound normal. Now it came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked towards the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. This was in the context of the moaning and groaning people of Israel for food. We're not told an awful lot at that point about it, but the cloud didn't leave them alone in chapter 24. And we're looking in verse 16. And it says, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses on, was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Again, later on, back down from the mountain, Moses was in that place of personal and intimate communion with the Lord in his tent outside the camp. And we read this in chapter 33 <clears throat> from verse 18. And Moses, uh, and he said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, 
you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. You shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. It seems that God understood that Moses wanted to see him rather than just glory. But the thing that Moses said was, show me your glory. It would also seem that God's glory encompassed his goodness, his grace, his compassion, as well as his person. But that glory kind of enfolded it all. We could look at the dedication of the temple too, and through any number of the Psalms and most of the prophets and on into the New Testament, pausing perhaps long enough just to mention Ezekiel, who seemed to see that bright and shining, enfolding, perplexing glory of God almost everywhere while he was in exile. He saw it by the river, on the plain, and even in his own house. And perhaps we just need to recognize that what Stephen saw as he looked up into heaven, as he was being stoned, was the glory of God. Now, that's the bright, shiny, heavenly glory. Now, before Christmas, I spoke at Derry Road here about the glory of God. In fact, it's been on my heart quite a lot um, recently. Um, I am um, caught by the glory of God. Um, and I was looking particularly at the things that people said that, glory, that um, glorified God. Um, and I remember the surprise I had when I looked at the things that they said, where scripture specifically tells us, at least, in that new king james that god was glorified and they didn't pick it fit into my mental picture at all of what would glorify him so um i began following the scent of that tree. i hope you do that through scripture um you you get a taste of something and you think man i, I need to follow this uh, on further so um I, I i want to go a bit further than i did uh, in that message before christmas and there's a lot more than what I am going to talk about in terms of glory um, in our God. So in my own mind, glory was always um, connected with something out there that was awesome, that was bright and shiny, belonging to heaven and God. But if we come back into John's gospel and have a look, we'll find that there's um, something very different being shown about glory there. So if we go back into um, chapter one of John and looking at our key verse, that's verse 14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Now, John doesn't tell us that he just saw the glory. It wasn't a glimpse. It wasn't something passing. This was a far stronger word. This was something constantly looked at. This was a facet of Jesus, the Messiah, that they were able to see constantly and consistently. And John, having started his story from the eternal perspective and having declared that this one about whom he was going to share the story of his ministry was the word, the logos of God, he doesn't want to tell us first about the power of his sermons or the range and variety of his miracles. The thing that had, had most affected John and made him that follower of Jesus, that lover of Jesus that he was, and the rest of the disciples too, they beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And yet that glory, like the, the glory of the, the Lord that shone round those angels in Luke that we read about before, it seems to be totally, almost totally absent from John's gospel. As they walked with him, those bright and shiny parts of the life of Jesus that they witnessed were very few and far between. 
So I, I'm, we're going to look through John's gospel um, at where glory comes. And uh, I did discover that um, glory, glorify and glorified appear 34 times in John's gospel using the New King James. Um, we're not going to be looking at them all. It's all right. 34 times. I've never realized that in Matthew. Matthew manages 12 times. Luke, a lot better, he has 22. And obviously Mark being the servant um, gospel, he only has four. Um, so this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now it would be so easy to think that the main thing that would have marked John's mind and heart would have been those hours when he stood helpless at the foot of the cross, we sang, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Uh, that would have been, you would have thought, the most powerful memory of, uh, uh, of John's experience with Jesus. But that's not what he says. He says that word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Not we be, I beheld the agony of his death or even he didn't say we beheld the miracle of his empty tomb. It was his glory that John remembered and he beheld it. The other thing um, I ought, ought to say is that maybe the New King James um, translation gives a slightly wrong impression because it uses that word begotten. And that has implications that we could misunderstand. Um, we tend to think of the, the begotten bit as, you know, the genealogies, you know, so-and-so begat, so-and-so who begat, and that sort of thing. But that's not what this is about at all. Um, John is not trying to say that Jesus was begotten. That word, um, I'm not going to use the Greek here, but that word actually means the, the special, the only one, the unique one. So we're talking about John saw the unique glory of the unique son of the father. Um, and what were the qualities of this glory? Was it bright and shiny? No, no. He, he wanted us to know that Jesus was full of grace and truth. He could have perhaps used power and wisdom or sermons and miracles or even signs and wonders, but John had it in his heart to tell us that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Haven't you found that? In your dealings with him, he's full of grace and truth. Okay, let's have a look at some of the um, passages in John. If you go into chapter two, and uh, I'm just reading from verse 11. It says this, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Um, now, John could so easily have written, if you listen carefully, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and his disciples believed in him. I don't know if you noticed the difference. I missed out that bit and manifested his glory. The disciples didn't just believe because of the miracle sign, but that we're told that they, they believed because Jesus revealed or showed his glory. Now, there was nothing bright or shiny in view, but his disciples saw that glory and believed in him. They also saw in that miracle the power that Jesus had over physical matter. And they also saw in that sign his grace and compassion in resolving the, the issue caused by human failure and the wine running out. So there was glory in that. Let's go on. Um, I'm picking them um, so we're not going to be here forever. Um, chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus. Again, I'm just going to pick a couple of verses. Um, we're going to look at <clears throat> verse 4. It says, when Jesus heard that, and the, the that was that Lazarus was ill, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then if we go into um, verse 40 in chapter 11, Jesus said to her, that's to Martha, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see 
the glory of God. Now, if you read that chapter carefully, it's actually very hard to see where or when Jesus said that to Martha, as John actually doesn't report it. But it's very clear that Jesus knew that his glory would be seen. He knew that the Son of God would be glorified through it. Once again, the glory that they had seen was not that bright and shiny glory. It was in the display of Jesus's power over death and the decay of death. They saw his glory. Let's move on um, into chapter 12. Um, chapter 12 has the first part of the hour that's come. OK, um, we're in verse 23. But Jesus answered them. That's Andrew and Philip who come talking about the, Gentile, uh, the Gentiles, the Greeks wanting to see Jesus. And Jesus said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, I don't know about you, but thinking through the events that were going to take part, place, it doesn't seem to be anything that's, wow, you know, um, bright and shiny there at all. In fact, um, this is the time of that ride into Jerusalem on the donkey, a time that was so mystifying to the disciples that, as it says in verse 16 of that chapter, they didn't understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. John, John spreads the story around this glory of Jesus in the context of this hour of Jesus's death. In verse 28, um, Jesus prays, Father, glorify your name. And he, John records the response, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. There's nothing bright or shiny about this hour, except that, well, first Jesus had declared, hadn't he, um, in verse 24, that um, a grain of wheat doesn't yield anything unless it dies. But if it dies, he said in verse 24, it produces much grain. Now, remember, the disciples didn't understand these things until he was glorified. He was going to produce much grain. Amen. And then Jesus also displayed his ability to reach the whole world. The Pharisees were talking, weren't they, uh, in verses 19 and 20. And they said, look, the, the world's gone after him. And already we had that mention of the Greeks had come asking for an introduction. He wasn't going to be just focused on the immediate, the, the locality. Um, he was going to be looking like a, a Zoom meeting across the world. Then uh, moving on, we come to perhaps the most intense glory passage in chapter 13. And if we read from um, verse 31. So when he had gone out, now the he there, I'm sure you're all very aware, was actually Judas. Um, but Judas it says that Satan had entered in, into him. So he'd gone out, okay? So when he had gone out, <clears throat> Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Now, can I just say, I, I, that is so full of interlocking wonders. All I can do is absorb it. I, I can't say, hey, I know that, I've got that. Um, that for me is something that I, I need the Lord to really open up more. <laughs> but there's an, a, an enfolding of glory, isn't there? God is glorified in him. And God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. And there's nothing bright or shining about it. It seems totally counterintuitive that Jesus should say, now he was glorified. It was just a room with 12 people, no angelic interventions, no declarations from heaven. In this place, glorification directly relates to the submission of Jesus to the will of his father, 
to obedience. John has just told us that Satan had entered Judas, and it's clear that Jesus spoke to Satan in Judas when he said, told him to be quick doing what he was going to do. It's also clear that an inevitable process had begun that was the outworking of the Father's will. As soon as Jesus had got, uh, Judas had gone out, Jesus brings glory into it. There's no sign of anything bright and shiny. But Jesus, at that moment, had demonstrated his complete authority over Satan. What confidence should that give to you and me? Now, uh, glory was about to be expressed in different ways. And these are ways that now directly involve his disciples. And by extension, that's you and me. In chapter 14, in verse 13. <clears throat> Okay, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I, I, who would ever have thought that me asking something in the name of Jesus, that he does, will actually bring the Father glorifying, glory in the Son? There's nothing bright or shiny, but this involves you and me. As long as we are believing, working, asking, and praying saints, we will bring glory to the Father when Jesus answers our requests. We've just been through a week of prayer and fasting. And just the realization that um, the glory that was, uh, the potential in that situation of um, Jesus answering our requests, and we've begun to see some answers to our week of prayer already. And then in chapter 15, in verse 8, it says this, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So now it's not Jesus alone bearing fruit, but this involves you and me. <clears throat> if we are those branches and bear fruit because we're abiding in the vine, then the Father will be glorified as we yield much fruit. Father will be glorified and we'll be his disciples because we'll be doing what he was talking about earlier on in chapter 12, about bringing forth much fruit and falling into the ground and dying and bearing fruit. Then in chapter 16, Verse 14, he's talking of the Holy Spirit here. And he says, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it unto you. Now, that's the Holy Spirit working in believers like you and me. So in these just these last three places, we've seen the Father glorified in the Son. We've seen the Father glorified and Jesus glorified by the Holy Spirit, and in each of those places, we're involved. Um, wow, <clears throat> we can bring glory to God. Um, next place, is John 17. <clears throat> I said before that um, possibly there was the most intense glory place, but John 17 is very, very close. Um, <clears throat> In that prayer, we start off, Jesus spoke those, these words. Now, which words were they that he spoke? <clears throat> I, I'm not sure if he was really referring to the prayer that was coming or the things that he had just said, could, uh, if you read it through carefully. I think they came from chapter 16, um, from verse 31, say. Um, and these were the words. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that, to me, is the key part. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Whatever the difficulties are, 
he's already stated it. He has overcome the world. This one who had authority over death, who had authority over Satan, who had authority. Anyway, he's already demonstrated that authority in so many different ways. And now he comes to that um, chapter in chapter 17. Okay, so Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now, um, you know, I said before about reading John's Gospel, that chapter, well, my ordinary reading, I've just been reading through Genesis. And as I'm reading that um, section of John 17, I can almost hear, as it were, the antidote for sin beginning to be administered. When they were expelled from the garden, it was to stop Adam and Eve from being able to eat from the tree of life and living forever in that place of disobedience and rebellion. But now the hour has come when Jesus could give eternal life to as many as the Father had given him. Verse three, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do, and now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is the enfolding glory again. This is glory from every angle. Jesus has glorified the Father on the earth. How had he done that? Well, I guess by finishing the work that he'd been given to do. He'd done it in a, that place of submission, of obedience, of relationship, and he glorified the Father. And now he said, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Oh, this is the beginning of that um, heavenly, bright, shiny glory coming. But it sounds like there's going to be some amazing regal spectacle, a, a, a triumphal procession, a, 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 an enthronement going on. Instead, the world was going to be witness to the most amazing display of unity and obedience. Verse four says it clearly, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. He had undone all that work that Adam and Eve did. He had laid his life down in total obedience. He had undone everything that was um, disobedience and rebellion. He'd finished the work. And then in verse 10, it says, and all mine are yours and yours are mine. And here we go. And I am glorified in them. You know, looking around, we're sitting on settees, we're, um, we're, we're thinking, we're scratching our heads, whatever we do. And Jesus, in talking to the Father, says, I am glorified in them. Whoever you are, whether, whatever part of the world, whatever time of day or night it might be, that's what Jesus is wanting to, us to know tonight, that he has um, glorified, brought glory into you and me. He's glorified in us. But there's even more yet. In verse 22 to 24, it says this, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, 
for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus had glorified his father on earth. He said, I've finished the work which you have given me to do. That door to eternal life that had been closed because of Adam, because he didn't believe God, he didn't finish the work that was given to him. But Jesus did both. So now, not only is that door to eternal life open again, but here, we're back to where John started in the, his gospel. Jesus has said that they may behold my glory. John had said, we beheld his glory, which you have given me, that, and that we should know that perfect oneness. And it says this, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one. Somebody was saying, as we were gathering tonight, the unity that there is in that body of Christ, wherever we are in the world, whatever um, particular aspect of, or flavor of church that we're involved with, there is a wonderful sense of unity amongst us. Amen. The glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Moses wanted to see God's glory. <clears throat> John declared that he and the other disciples had seen that glory. Stephen, in his dying moments, saw that glory. <clears throat> they saw it as full of grace and truth. They saw it in the, uh, the disciples, saw it in the power of Jesus over physical things, the things of this world. They saw it in the display of Jesus's power over death and the decay of death in his amazing ability um, and, in, uh, in, and the intention to bring much fruit and to reach the whole world. They saw it in the demonstration of his authority over Satan. <clears throat> but the greatest expression of that glory is actually for us. And the glory which you gave me, Jesus said, I have given them, that they may <clears throat> be one as we are one. I, now, I don't know tonight. Um, I haven't been able to see you. I really don't like preaching to a, a dot on my screen. <clears throat> this morning when I was preaching with my time, I, I was able to um, interact with people and... <sighs> but I'm sure that tonight there are hearts that have been perplexed about who, I, who I, am I? I don't seem to be doing anything. I'm just a me. <clears throat> hey, listen. We're part of that wonderful body of Christ. We're part of his church. We're part of those, those people to whom God has said, I'm giving you my glory. And I do believe that he wants it to be really bright and shiny too. He wants us to be bright and shiny for other people so that we're not displaying some kind of miserable, um, beaten sort of Christianity, but a relationship with God that actually makes us vibrant and alive um, oh, that we might be able to display that glory of God and that people might say that glory there, that's not, that's not power and dominion. That's not um, self and pride. That's not anything else. I tell you what, that's grace and truth. May we, all of us, know what it is to be filled with grace and truth. Amen. Can we pray? Lord, I'm sure that there's a lot of people here tonight who could have expressed what you've put on my heart far better than I did. But you've given it to me and you've given this opportunity. Lord, and just want, and we want to come open our hearts up to you tonight to say thank you for the ministry uh, in song, thank you for the ministry and just those fellowship moments together. Lord, but thank you most of all that you want to display your glory 
in each one of us. That our lives, Lord, might be testimony to that unity of the body, to that um, fulfilling of the purposes of our God. Lord, that we might know that we're walking, Lord, like you walk, Lord. Lord, that we might also finish the work that you've given us to do. Whether it's great or whether it's small, Lord, we want to be those who finish the work that we've been given to do. And to that end, Lord, we want to be just like Jesus and submit ourselves to you and say, Lord, have our lives. Lord, we've said it many times before, probably, but here we are now, Lord, saying, what I am, Lord, let it be yours. And you work out your glory. You glorify your Father, Lord, through the life that each one of us are living. That indeed, Lord, <laughs> we might be bringing glory to you every day and in every way. And that we might declare, Lord Jesus, that you are the head of your church and that your church is glorious, wherever it is. Amen. Amen. I